Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. The glory of the Lord rise among us. The praises of the King rise among us. To let it rise. Well, good morning, New Covenant. How is everybody this morning? Well, hop up, walk over, meet and greet somebody, shake their hand, tell them the Lord looks good on them this morning. All right, I've got just one quick announcement before we get opened up here. Um, next Sunday, we have guest speaker Andrew Murray from England. Um, he's wrote the book, uh, The Miracle Table, or My Table. Well, we use it a lot for communion. Great book, great speaker. We've had him here before, so don't miss next Sunday and bring somebody out with you. But let's stand as we get ready to go to the Word. Um, Harold, can you go, in, go back into that some more, the glory of the Lord, before we get there? I can just, I can feel it boiling up as she's playing that. Let the glory of the Lord go rise among us. The glory of the Lord go rise. There's nothing among like us. the glory of the Lord, the church. The praises of the King rise among us and let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord go rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord go rise among us. Let the joy of the King go rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise this morning. Psalm 118, it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. 
my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the Lord. Come on, church, somebody say, I will call upon the Lord. That's why we're here is to call on you, Lord. We come into your presence, Father. We call on you this morning. We call in the name of Jesus. Have your way in this place, Lord. We don't want to be here without you. Come on, somebody say, I call upon the Lord. Come on, I call upon the Lord. Oh, have your way in this place, Lord. We give it to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. And I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Oh, I was breathing, but not. Alive. All my failures I tried <laughs> to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You call, you call my my soul and now your freedom is all that I know the old made new Jesus when I met you you call you call my My sin was heavy, my chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My
Sounds like a plan to me. Well, we don't have the words up there? God calling Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> you talking about the first verse? It says, I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb until I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb until I met you. And then the second verse is the answer to that on the other side. Now your mercy, hang on a second. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old made new Jesus when I met you. Amen. Oh, I was buried beneath my shame. Hey, turn it up a little bit if you want. Who could carry that kind of weight? Thank you. It was my turn till I met you. Just when I met you, you called, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Oh, out of My sin was heavy, but chains wake at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my Graves into gardens. He turns your grave into a garden. Whatever you call a grave, <laughs> he's amazing. Oh, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty brain. 
lives and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and you put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Sing it with me. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. No, there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the
Cause he knows my name And oh how he walks with me And oh how he talks with me And oh how he tells me That I am his own You know my name You Yeah. 
we just thank you. We thank you that we can come before you and give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Father, we thank you for your protection. We thank you for your healing. We thank you for your guidance. Father, we thank you for the angels that just surround us, for the wings to just hover over us. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you live and abide in us to help us walk step by step in your ways. And Holy Spirit, may you just have freedom this morning to move in our midst. And if there's anybody here that does not know you the way that we should know you, I pray that there is a freedom that they can step forward with no objection, no wall whatsoever. May all the walls fall in the name of Jesus. We just thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased in that I'm never alone. You're good, good father. for answers far and wide but I know that we're all searching for answers that you provide you know just what we need before we say a word you're good good father who I am. Everybody say, it's who I am. It's who I am. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. It's who I am. I want to share this scripture with you. It's in Isaiah 26, 3. And it says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Isn't that a wonderful scripture to have in your heart? He will keep you in perfect peace. And that word is shalom. And there's so much in, in that word, shalom. It's, it's peace. It's wholeness. It's prosperity. It's health. It's a, it's a, it's a total well-being. <laughs> and so if you are focusing on God, it says whose mind, and that word mind is the whole person, not just your thoughts, but it's your whole person. If everything you do, if you eat and sleep Jesus every moment of your life and you're focused on him, then that shalom of God will flood into your life. And no matter what is happening around you, no matter what is going on on the outside, no matter what storms, as we talked about Wednesday, are coming to your life, whatever it is, God's going to take care of you. He's going to love you, and he's going to bless you. And so uh, there's so much uncertainty in life. We all know that. We all see that. We all live it, you know, every single day. But I think God, what God is showing us is that we just need to focus on him. He needs to be the one that has our attention, right? He needs the, he's the one that we need to look to. He's the one that we need to pray to. He's the one that we need to listen to. He's the one that we need to read, right? He is the one. <laughs> and when we do all those things with all of our heart, his shalom will fill up our life. <laughs> and even though we may not have the answers to what's going to happen, we know that God is there. He's taking care of us. He will make sure that we are successful in everything we put our hands to and our heart to. God loves us. And he's in control of this life. He's in control, <laughs> right? Nothing is getting away from him. Not one single tidbit of things is getting past God. He loves you. <laughs> and the power of God is going to flow through you when you focus on him, right? And he will touch you. He will bless you. He will make you whole. He will make you successful. He will make you overcoming in this life, <laughs> He will do it. And in addition, he has promised you eternal life. Glory to God. <laughs> the moment you take your last breath, you will be in his presence. Glory to God. <laughs> I can't wait for that moment. I want to live my life, but I am not afraid of that moment, Lord. I'm not afraid <laughs> to be in his presence, to love him, to feel his breath against my cheek as he hugs me. <laughs> Glory to God. I just can't imagine. But all I know is God is good. Amen? Focus on him, Amen. and he will give you perfect peace. So look to the person next to you and say, Shalom. Look to the person next to you and say, Shalom. <laughs> and believe it with all your heart because it's true. Amen? Amen. Ushers, why don't you come on up? I've got a couple of prayer announcements and then we'll pray over the tithe and the offering. Brian Francis, he's got COVID and double pneumonia. He's in uh, the Washington University Hospital in ICU. So we want to lift him up for healing and also for salvation in his life. And then for the Lindsay family, uh, prayers for peace for that family. They lost Mel Lindsay. It was a father and a grandfather. And so we want to lift up that family. So that's uh, everybody bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We lift up these needs right now in the name of Jesus. We lift up the Lindsay family and we lift up Brian Francis. We ask, Lord, that you heal them, give them shalom in their hearts. Hallelujah. Father, that you heal their bodies. 
in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for, for this wonderful day, for the time that we're living in, for this moment right now. <laughs> and we give you thanks. We humble ourselves in your presence. And we thank you, Father, for today and the opportunity to hear your word. We ask, Lord, that your word touch us in a very real way. We thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in our lives. We thank you for our loved ones who couldn't be here. Father, we just thank you for, for giving us a home, giving us something to eat, giving us a job, for giving us hope in the name of Jesus and love and grace and mercy, all things we don't deserve, but you give it to us in abundance, Father. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for the tithe and the offering this morning. We ask, Lord, that you blessed the gift and the giver. And we just ask, Lord, that you multiplied in the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. Sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength My story isn't over, my story's just begun A failure won't define me, that's what my father does No failure won't define me, that's what my father does Ooh. Lay your burdens down Ooh, In the Father's house So check your shame at the door It ain't welcome anymore Ooh, You're in the Father's Arrival Arrival's not the end game The journey's where you are You never wanted perfect You just wanted my heart And the story isn't over If the story isn't good No failure's never final When the father's in the room Failure's never final when the father is in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the father's house. So check your shame at the door. It ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the father's house. Prodigals come home to helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical find things. Love's breaking through when the father's in the room. Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Oh, love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Shame at the door, it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Ooh, 
You're in the Father's house. You're in the Father's All right, amen. So the kids, you may be dismissed this morning, and let's give our pastor, Jerry Moore, a warm welcome as he comes up. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Father, we come before your presence, and I just ask that you would give me clarity of mind, clarity of purpose, and Father, I ask in Jesus' name that, Lord, the words that were spoken today, that your words in particular, God will minister and will find residence in the mind and in the heart of all the people here. And Lord, may something good be for everybody. And I give you praise for that in Jesus' mighty name. And we all said a big amen, right? <clears throat> well, this message can apply to any occupation, to any person that's here. But since I'm in the ministry, um, I've checked out some statistics about pastors. And uh, this, the statistics that I'm going to be giving will be uh, really, I think it's a view of the ministry from the lower story. And if you've been here on Wednesday nights, you know what we're talking about. The upper story is God's view. The lower story is our view. So I came across some of these st statistics and over 1,700 pastors leave the ministry every month last year. I, th I find that so hard to believe. Over 1,700 pastors left the ministry in 2000. I'm, I'm sorry, not last year. It was 2019. And over 1,300 were terminated by the local church. They were voted out. And I've been a part of that. Whenever you, I got voted in, I've got voted out. And, uh, <clears throat> and some of those who leave the ministry do so because they're calling into another ministry or another occupation. The reality, though, is that 250 pastors burn out, or they quit, or they resign, or they retire. And I find that also interesting. One reason for the burnout is the fact that 70% of the ministers feel they don't have any close friends. Now, that's sad whenever they're pastoring a church. Now, that's not the case here. Every one of you is a close friend of mine. So yet others feel they can't hear from God. Now, there's been seasons that I felt like, man, God, I don't, I don't even hear a word you're saying. And, uh, but this can definitely affect the direction that you think that God's leading the church. And some feel underpaid, overworked, their own call 24-7, and the list goes on. And I can understand that. It's estimated that 75% of all ministers live close to the poverty line. And a guilt or a lack of faith prevents them from seeking a second job. The average stay for a senior pastor is four years. And half of the ministers beginning their pastorate will not survive five years. They will self-destruct or else they will be chewed up by the congregation with the faction or frictions that's going on. And there are many other stats that some may find interesting. Some pastors in a board-ran church, and whenever I was in, in starting out in ministry, I was in the board-ran church, and so the pastors, they could, I mean, the congregation could vote you in or out. But whenever I was called back to this church, I said, if you're looking for a board-ran church, I'm not the guy. I believe in a pastor-ran church, and I really believe that whenever God calls people, he doesn't call a board. He calls a person. And so that's why I think that this is why it's very important that we recognize that. Uh, but now let me just say that the hazards of having a pastor-ran church is that you can become a dictator. And uh, it's my way or the highway. But I've adopted the philosophy that the highway is my way and the highway is your way. The highway is Yahweh. And so we just need to learn to live together in unity and in harmony and peace and work together for the common cause of the glory of God being established here in our, in our midst. <clears throat> so um, 
Let me just read. This is a view of the ministry now from the upper story. And I'll tell you how I got to this. Well, I'll tell you right now. I was studying for the other message that I finished last week about Jacob. And um, I was just, I was fixing coffee and and I was getting ready to to get my mind occupied and going toward this. And this is whenever I came across this, this word came to me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I'd memorized that several times. Uh, several years before, but I had to look at it, look it up. But let's read that particular passage. It's found in Matthew eleven twenty five 25 through 29. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudence, and you have revealed them to the babes. Even so, Father, for, you, for so it seems good in your sight. Now look at this. All things have been delivered to me by the Father, and no, one ex- and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Wow. And Jesus is willing, he's wanting to reveal the heart of the Father to every one of us. This is why I asked him to sing the, the Father's house here. Now he says, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, that's a view from the upper story. Now, ministers that go through, I've been here 40 years, Gishon. I mean, the average stay of a senior pastor is four years. I've been here 40, 10 times that. Now, you say, well, have you had any problems? Good night. Yes. Everybody has problems, right? Right? Everybody goes through tests and trials and tribulations, persecution, you name it. But it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's uncommon. But God says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I'm going to be re- talking about the prodigal son in just a minute, how that the prodigal son reveals the heart of the father, as well as how that the, the elder brother who stayed home, he also reveals the heart of the father. And so let's view the ministry from the upper level. Uh, All things have been delivered to me from the Father. This is Jesus speaking. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom I will reveal him the Father too. So he says, basically saying, I and the Father are one. If you, if you know me, you know the Father. So as God's going to reveal to us the Father God, even today, I trust that every one of us will get a, a really, you know, and I don't understand the Trinity, okay? I know that we've got the Father, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I know it's sort of like, it's like water can be in a solid liquid or a gas form. I understand that. But as for, that, that's just not a, quite a, a, an illustration for me to grasp the Trinity of God. And I know that He's God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. They are all one. Yet, the Father says, or the Son says, I'm going to reveal the Father to whomever I want to. And so, and then the Holy Spirit, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let me go back here and just start reading this right here in John 17, 20. This is whenever we get a revelation of the Father who reveals the Son. I do not pray for these alone talking about the disciples, but for all those who would believe in me through their word. That's us. So he's, he's, Jesus has already prayed for us that we'd get a revelation of the Father, that they may be one, look at this, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, and they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that the glory makes us one. The glory makes us one together with each other and with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So whenever we begin to recognize the glory in one another and not recognizing faults and flaws and failures in other people, we begin to recognize the goodness of God in people. Because, you know, as Jason Rose used to say, God is good 
and all the time. Yes, that's right. So the glory makes us one. We have one body, but there's many members in the body. They all don't have the same function. You know, the eye can't say to the ear, I have no need of you because you don't see things like I see them. Because, you know, and, and there's, there's a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of pastors, there's a lot of, if you don't see things like I see them, you're in the wrong church. I don't believe that congregation. I believe that every one of us is entitled to your own ridiculous opinion. And you can have whatever opinion you want about anything, but the Holy Spirit is the one who is going to reveal to you the Word of God. And again, as I'm teaching, I just want us to all, let's appreciate the different views that each of us have. I mean, Myrna thinks we've got, that Jesus had, uh, how many chromosomes did you think he had? And I disagree. I thought he had 46 chromosomes. If you're, so it doesn't make any difference. You know, because you know what, whatever it is, it is. But we will know the truth later on. So she's entitled to her opinion, and I'm entitled to my ridiculous opinion, right? <clears throat> But let's appreciate one another's view. John 14, 1 through 6, it says, Let not your, and this is really a very timely thing. Sean Hannity quotes this about every time he's on, Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart, and folks, it's a hard thing to do whenever you begin to see our government from the lower level. And from the lower story. But whenever we begin to see the Father's will and the Father's glory from the upper story, folks, we've got a wonderful outcome. And the reward is out of this world, right? Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, which means there are many levels of consciousness up there. Many levels, and we grow from one level, we go from faith to faith, we go from glory to glory, we go from strength to strength. So I just want you to know that in my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And then Thomas speaks up and he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, and so Jesus said, from this point forward, from now on, you know him and you have seen him. Why is that? Because they were with him for three years and they saw him. But so he says, from now on, you're going to know the Father. From now on, you, have, you know him and you've seen him. And then Philip speaks up and he says, Lord, show us the Father. It'll be sufficient for us. Now, can you believe that these disciples are really, they, they're not hanging on every word. I mean, probably Philip was somewhere out there shooting marbles or just, just playing around with other guys. But listen, but listen to this. <clears throat> Philip, he says, this is very elementary. Have you been with me so long and yet you have not known me? We've been living together for three years and I've been traveling, I've been teaching and we've been, you've seen me do miracles, you've seen everything. He said, but he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how in the world can you say, show us the Father? If you're looking at me, you're seeing the Father because I and the Father are on one. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? And the words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. The Father who dwells within me does the works. And the Holy Spirit is our helper to reveal the works to one another. And to, feel the, to, to reveal the function of the body. And Jesus, he went ahead and he further stated, he says, I only do what I see the Father doing. And I only speak what I hear the Father speaking. So then Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now this is Jesus speaking. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now whenever you look up the word labor, that means to grow weary and tired and exhausted with toil. Burdens or griefs, be it other people or be it your own. It means bodily labor, whenever you get tired. I will give you rest. I will give you a refreshing. 
And this is the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. This is the refreshing wherein it causes the weary to rest. He says, and it's also best defined as to take ease, to be quiet and calm, to be patient, have a patient expectation for God to just give you peace and rest. And we all need that rest and peace from him that comes. But Jesus said, you know, take my yoke upon you and learn of me because I am meek and lowly and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me and you will find rest for your souls. And the purpose of rest is to recover or to collect your strength because you've been exhausting yourself from time to time. Now here's the upper story view of the ministry. My yoke is easy. Now these ministers that 1,700 a month that left the ministry, apparently, I'm, I'm sure they read this, but they haven't the idea of how to view your life, your ministry, from the upper story point of view. My yoke is easy. It's a better way. It's good, gracious, and kind. It's fit for use. It means mild, and it means pleasant. My yoke is easy. And whenever you see a yoke, you know, it's like being yoked to a it's like uh, uh, you, got, you got Jesus on one side and you're on the other side. And whenever he is there with you pulling the burden, guess who's doing the most? He is. Because whenever you try to do it on your own flesh and you try to do the will of God in the, in the, own, the efforts of the flesh, what happens is you wear out real quick and you burn out. But whenever you allow God to be yoked with you, Jesus to be yoked with you, or the Father to be yoked with you, guess what? The Father does the work. He's the one that does the pulling. All you do is you walk right along beside him, let him do the pulling. And the Holy Spirit is there to help you put one foot in front of the other. He is our helper. He's the paraclete, another of the same kind, just like Jesus. And he's there, he lives, and he's not only in you, he's with you. Every one of us. So this is why my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So my question is, is are ministers living in the lower story too much? Are we, uh, what are the reasons for the burnouts? What are, what are the reasons for the dropouts? What are the reasons for people resigning? Whenever Linda and I first got here, we'd had a work day and we had, I think we had about five kids that ended up in the uh, emergency room. And the next Sunday morning, I remember right there on 9th Street, was getting ready to turn down a mod. Uh, I said, Linda, we're going to give this six months, and then we're out of here. I said, I can't take that. I mean, these, it was, it, and Jeremy, you were one of them. Don't look at me. Googly. I mean, you, you and Sarah. I mean, the, it's just really, it, I said, God. And I took, I took them on a float trip one time. The whole family, all the families of the church, we had about 50 people going on a float trip. And, folks, I'm telling you what, I have never been so scared my whole life. Jeremy, you're just a little, just floating around, bobbing around, and, and not only that, but, but Trav and Linda, they, we, I mean, they're the adults in the room, and they turned their boat over, right? As soon as they got in the canoe, they turned it over, and Travis lost his billfold. I hope you're happy, Travis. <laughs> Did she say amen? <laughs> I'm exactly right. But we had, a, and then we had a baptism along the way, so I mean, Congregation, this is just, you can see why I was getting burnt out real quick and I hadn't even started. I was just on fire and I said, Linda, we'll give it six months and then we're out of here. But folks, that six months turned into six years and six years turned into 40 and we're still here. To God be the glory. Thank you. Thank you. But I think that so many times we get used to living, and again, I... I didn't know come here from Sikkim about how to be a pastor. Never been one before. But you know, I really realized to dwell above with those we love, that is glorious. But to dwell below with those we know, well, that's another story. And so trying to live and work with all these people is really, I mean, it was just crazy. And then... Um, but the goal and the purpose is to live, this is my opinion, the goal or the purpose is to live in the lower story with the upper story, the mindset or the viewpoint, is to live with God's 
mindset because he says, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. So therefore, we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. If that be the case, why can't we use it? It's like having money in the bank that you don't spend. So we have the mind of Christ. And, I t- and, the, and the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. Anybody need any of those? Well, that's where we, we get them is from the Holy Spirit. And so I really think that this is exactly how Jesus lived with us with the upper story mindset, especially with Philip. Philip says, the Lord just show us the Father and we'll be happy. Philip, how long have you known me? If you know me, you know the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Or else, and he says, and not only that, but if you don't believe that, believe me because of the Father's workings. You know, um, I want to show you this. I have preached on Luke chapter 15 several times about the prodigal son and about the elder brother, but I really haven't seen this from the Father's point of view. So let's turn our attention to the uh, Luke 15 about the prodigal son and how these two sons reveal the father's heart and they brought um, action toward their father each time. Now let's read this. This is found, uh, Luke uh, 15, 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portions of good that falls to me So he divided, the father divided to them, so the elder brother got the same amount as the prodigal son. So he divided to them. So it wasn't that the the elder brother didn't have anything to, to celebrate. And not many days after the younger son had gathered all together, he journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living, with wine, women, and song. But folks, that far country is not, it's not California. It could be the next county over, Ripley, Butler. It doesn't have to even be a geographical location, but just recognize that he spent it all with riotous living. And when he had spent it all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he would have gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. But whenever he came to himself. Now what does that mean? Whenever he recognized his true identity. And last week I told you that integrity, it has to do with the number one thing that integrity has to do with is who are you? Number two is, is, is your source. What is your source? Your job is not your source. God is your source. And not only that, but why are you here? So it's purpose. So integrity is looking at identity and source and purpose. And so the prodigal son, he came to himself. He recognized that his identity was to whom he belonged. And he belonged to the father. And look at this. And he said, How many of my father's hard servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hard servants. And when he arose and came to his father, look at this. But when he was still a long way off, the father saw him. The father didn't go looking for him, but whenever the father, the son was coming home, the father saw him while he was alone. And so he had compassion and he ran and he fell, fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to him, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to, he didn't even answer that. He said, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his feet and sandals on his feet and let's kill the fatted calf and because let's eat and be merry because my son who was once lost is now found. Look at the attitude of the father. For my son was dead, now he's alive again. Now the older son, let me just finish the rest of this and then we'll go. The older son was in the field and whenever he came near to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. and He said, what is all this about? So he called one of his servants and said, what, is, what does this mean? 
He said to him, well, your brother, your younger brother has come home because he has received him safe and sound. The father, the father has killed the, the fatted calf, but the elder son was angry and would not go in. Man, this, this is my younger brother. Yes, we both got our share, but he went out and spent it all, and now he's coming back home. Look what dad's doing with him. He's throwing a party. Does that make sense? I didn't do that. I stayed here and I worked with him and I labored with him. So he said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you and I never transgress your commandments at any time. Boy, that's pious, isn't it? I never made a mistake. I never did anything wrong. Well, he's doing something wrong now. The attitude with which he's presenting himself to the, to the, about his, his, el, his uh, younger brother coming home, that is bad news. And yet, you never even gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. I got a question. Why would you want a goat to celebrate with your friends? A goat tastes just like it smells. It stinks to high heaven. So you, you, let's, kill, let's, let's kill a young calf or something. But, but uh, just a couple of points here about the father. The father didn't go looking for the son. But the father was looking for the son to come home. And so when he was a long way off, the father saw him, and his heart was pounding, and he had compassion on his son, and he ran out, threw his arms around the neck, and kissed him, and the son started the speech, and the father wasn't listening. <coughs> the father wasn't listening to all that spill. Why? Because he had an upper story viewpoint. Look at this. He was, he was calling his servants while the son was trying to repent. I, I like the heart of that father. Man, I like that. And he says, quick, I'm in a hurry. I'm excited. Bring a set of clean clothes and get my son cleaned up. Now, how many people, I mean, many people have said to me, look, whenever I get cleaned up, get my life cleaned up, I'm going to come to church. I said, man. That's like saying, when I get in shape, I'm going to go work out at Planet Fitness. It's crazy. This is why we come to church, is to get our life straightened out. This is why we come to the Father, because He will clean us up, and He will put a robe on our back, and He'll put a ring on our, on our finger and sandals on our feet. Some of us, I think that we've, been, we've had sandals put on our hands and our ring put on our toe. Just built backwards. <clears throat> And let's kill the best cow and let's party. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice what the father didn't say. Perhaps this would have been the reaction from the lower, lower story father. I told you what would happen. You wouldn't listen. He didn't say that. <coughs> he said, I tried to warn you. He didn't say that either. I really hope you have learned your lesson. How many people in the lower story would have said that? You made your bed. Why don't you just lie, lay in it? How many said that before? You have embarrassed the family name. Now he's making it about himself. The father didn't make it about himself. The father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but they would have eternal life. Look at the love of this father. And not only that, <coughs> excuse me. The attitude of the father was one of celebration. So the prodigal son revealed the heart of the father unintentionally. He was just coming back home because he had a bad, he had really, he had some bad problems and, and but whenever he got back home, he found the father was forgiving. His father was compassion. His father was, had mercy that showed up to him. And the elder brother, father, you haven't even given me a goat. He says, son, I've given you everything. All I have is yours. Everything that you've got, that I've got is yours. All you got, you've never asked me for a goat. And folks, the Bible says, we have not because we ask not. So you've got you've to ask before you can get. I'm going to close with this passage. <coughs> Excuse me.
Now, this is really interesting because it reveals the Father and the Son together. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. And it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us, this is Christmas message, a son is given. <clears throat> and the government shall be on his shoulders. Notice how closely the, that the identity of the son is tied to the father. Also, please note that the son wants to reveal the father to us all. And his name shall be called, his name shall be called Wonderful. All because of his wonderment that comes from the, his works in our lives. You say, well, how did that, I mean, what is the wonderment? What, don't you find God to be just full of wonder? You know, I wonder how he turned the water into wine. I wonder how he multiplied the fish and the loaves. Have you ever wondered that? How did he do it? I wonder how he walked on the water. I wonder how he cast out devils. I wonder how that he, 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 he gives healings to those, you know, the, the well, blinds, to the sight to the blind, to the people that couldn't hear, he gave hearing back to them, and to those who were limp and lame, you know, he restored them totally whole. I wonder how he did that. He did that with just the spoken word. Or the forgiveness of all of our sins. We were created in his likeness, and he says not only that, but greater things would you do than I've done, because I'm going back to the Father, and I'm going to send, he's going to send the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter, and he's going to be with you, and he's going to reveal everything to you. Isn't that neat? The Holy Spirit living, the third person, the Godhead, is living on the end. I can't believe that as I look out across the congregation and I'm seeing, the, I'm seeing individual faces, but I'm seeing the Holy Spirit who is the same in each one of us living in us to reveal the heart of the Father. <coughs> and he says his name will be called Wonderful and Counselor. He gives us all wisdom and counsel on projects and on our past you're not defined by your past. Keep in mind, keep that in mind. You're defined by who God says you are. And he says you are the righteousness of God in Christ. And he said there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And if you're in Christ Jesus, you're in the Father because if you've seen the, you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. And this is where we all are, one body. And this is how, where it's all going to sum up. We're going to have one body and we're going to be the bride of Christ and we're going to be living with him forever. <clears throat> <clears throat> and he said, there's a mighty God. You know, God is not a wimp. And he's not politically correct, nor does he care to be. He is his own boss. And he sets the standard. No one is greater than God. Can you say amen to that? And his name, now notice this. And this name, his name is called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. This is the name that goes to the Son. So these are the, so the, Jesus said, you know, I and the Father are one. I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father saying. So this is how the Son reveals to us the Father. Now, I started with Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son will reveal him to us. That's us. That's a hallelujah, isn't it? And he also says that his name will be called the Prince of Peace. That's what Cliff was talking about. In this world, and in this lower level, we're going to have conflict and struggle and turmoil and strife and confusion and division and mandated and vac uh, vaccination. We don't want that. But Jesus is our peace. Folks, if you want to be vaccinated, get vaccinated. But don't mandate me or any of my friends that don't want to be vaccinated. Don't mandate that to us. I mean, that's just nuts. But everybody is entitled to make their own decision on that particular part, right? <clears throat> but in the middle of this chaotic environment, God is our peace. He is our stabilizer. He is our gyroscope. Whenever the wind is blowing the ship all about, the gyroscope keeps us right on course. He is our peace. And in the middle of this chaotic environment, God is creating destinies and true identities and people who would discover their purposes in life and their eternal callings in God, which is still a mystery for most of us. 
It's still a mystery to be revealed at a later time. And now notice with this, and of the increase of his government and his peace, listen carefully, there will be no end. Hallelujah. We don't have to wait till the, till the Republicans get back in or the Democrats get back in. We, we got to recognize of his government, there is no end. It's forever. It's everlasting. It's, it's an eternal now, if you will. <clears throat> so let me just close with this statement, paragraph right here. Our Father is all-knowing. He knows there's not one thing. You know, a sparrow doesn't even fall from the sky unless he notices it. So our Father, he knows everything you're dealing with. He knows every situation that, is, that you're involved in. He knows every thought that goes through your mind. He knows every hair on your head. He knows everything about you. He knows where you came from. He knows where you are. He knows where you're going. So the Father is all-knowing. The Father is also all-powerful. He's the mighty God. There's nothing he can't do. And all things are possible to who? To those who believe. So let's just believe the mighty God, right? And he is ever-present. He never ceases to exist. David said, you know what? I was once young and I'm now old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. And he says, even if I make my bed in hell, he's down there. I heard about this pastor that, uh, <clears throat> black pastor, he said that, you know, he says, moms, you and your dads, he said, all your kids are going to hell because of these automobiles. I mean, they are, they're doing drugs in them. They're doing all kinds of things. They're robbing and getting away from the police, you know. And so this, these automobiles are sending your kids straight to hell. And one lady said, well, mine's son drives a GMC. He'll be back. <laughs> Toyota, you can do, put a Ford, whatever you want to put in there. But he will be back. Folks, but it's talking about hell. There is no back door in hell. So you don't want to go there. You can't escape. So this is why Jesus came. That he'd have life and have it more abundantly. Amen? So God is ever present. He never ceases to exist. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. He cannot be anything else but good. Hallelujah. I mean, can you imagine that? Wouldn't you like to be a father like that? I would love to be a father where there's nothing but good that comes out of me. It's getting better, but it's, I've got a long way to go. The Bible says God is love, and love never fails. You know, never fails. Love is not moody. It's not proud. It's not boastful. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't keep records of wrongs. Wow. That's the Father. He doesn't keep a record of wrong. He says, listen, you, you, there's 10 times you have done the same thing. Matter of fact, there's 100 times you've done the same thing. He's not keeping record. Love doesn't keep a record, and God is love. So love doesn't keep a record of all those things that you've done wrong. He says, I have an eraser. It's, it's, it's a divine eraser. I, I erase all of your sins, and I really, I, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far I have removed your transgressions from you. Now, folks, how far is the east from the west? He says, and I've cast your sins into the sea of my forgetfulness. I will never bring them up to you again. That's the Father. He sent Jesus to die for us so that all of our sins, past, present, and future, will be forgiven. Isn't that good news? Well, don't get happy about it right now. I'm just about finished here. <clears throat> he says, God is a God has mercy. His mercies are, listen, listen to this. They are new every morning. And great is his faithfulness to fulfill those mercies. So whenever you get up and you made a couple mistakes throughout the day, guess what? The mercies of God are still with you. They are still with you and they will never forsake you. You can't out the mercies of God. I've never thought about it like that, but I just said that. You can't out the mercies of God because wherever your sin goes, the mercies cover. Mercy covers it all. And not only that, but he is, the, he is the father of lights. 
He is the father of, and there, who, of whom there is no variables nor shadow of turning. So he is the father of illumination. God wants to reveal to you the heart of the father and the heart of the son and that they are one together and that they live on the inside of you. And not only do they live on the inside of you, but the Holy Spirit is ever present with you and he, he helps put you to bed. He helps you get up and he helps you give you ideas on how to do new projects. The Holy Spirit is guiding and directing every one of us. I'll close with this one. God, the Bible says, is the God of all, of the Father. He's the Father of all comfort. Wow. So you may be going through a turbulent time in your life. Maybe you've lost something. Well, the prodigal son was lost. He came home. There was a lost coin also and a lost sheep in that same passage. And, and every time, God comforts. He helps you find, restore, regain, and, and, and really uh, not only that, but to recover. And he's the God who wants to give you peace. And of his kingdom and of his peace, the Bible says, there will be no end. Aren't you looking forward to that? Well, he's right here now. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is on the inside of every one of you. So you've got to learn to see life from the upper story level. You've got a viewpoint. Get that in your mind that you can have that right now in this nasty now while you're living life. Amen? Well, I trust that hope helps somebody. So, Curtis, would you come right now and we'll dismiss us in prayer? Praise God. Good work, Pastor. Let me, can I just say one more thing? No, sir, you're done. <laughs> Good to have you home, bud. <clears throat> You know, there may be some people that are here that there may be one or two that you've, you've never met Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd just like to just say, you know, if you would like to know this father that I've been talking about here, and you, and you haven't met him, or perhaps you have met him, but you haven't been revealed to him like that, would you just raise your hand real quick? Yes, see that hand? Thank you. Anybody else? You need to see the Father's heart. And so this one that raised your hand, let's all stand right now. Everybody stand. I'm going to ask you if you come down. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray with you. Come on down. Yeah. <clears throat> come on down.
I'm going to bless you with the same blessing, and then I'm going to turn it to Curtis dismisses. <clears throat> it's really the blessings from number six. May the Lord bless and keep. Stretch your hands forward. Receive this now. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, causing you to forget the past and press on to the mark for the prize of the high calling. That's his divine purpose in your life. <clears throat> May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. Curtis. Amen. Say, I receive that. Well, somebody say, I am blessed. I am whole. I am healed. I am full of joy. I have peace beyond all understanding. I may not feel it all the time, but that's what the Lord says about me. If the Lord says it is true, and it's for me, and I receive it in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, somebody say, I am blessed. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you celebrate over us, that you love us no matter how far we stray. Thank you, Father, for being you. Lord, let us learn to see ourselves as you see us. Oh, we praise you and we worship you. We receive all your grace. We receive all your mercy, Father. Let us show it to others as we go out. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.